things. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, everybody. Welcome to the FAO series of international technical webinars that are being organized uh, by the FAO eLearning Academy in collaboration with Agrinium and with UN ESCAP. We are extremely pleased to have you all on board on this uh, new webinar which um, which will be uh, describing us uh, a little bit the importance of having a systematic approach when we talk about uh, nutrition, food systems, agriculture. We cannot see these different sectors separately, but we need to understand that they are uh, interlinked and that uh, it is crucial to have a systematic vision and approach them in a, a nutrition sensitive manner. So we have with us two experts who will be talking to us about this. Just a, um, a very brief introduction before we start. So first of all, I am uh, Christina Petracchi and I head the FAO eLearning Academy. And uh, I just wanted to share with you the idea behind these international webinars. The idea is really to have a space, an open space where we can share experiences, where we can uh, exchange ideas and have a neutral discussion forum around thematic areas uh, related to the, all the global challenges. The other thing I wanted to mention is that all the different thematic areas that are going to be covered in the different uh, webinars are all uh, covered in the FAO e-learning courses, which are available uh, free of charge um, in different languages and they are all available as a, a global public good through the FAO eLearning Academy. Uh, here uh, you can see on the screen uh, the link to the Academy which so it's, it's quite easy it's elearning.fao.org and um, so you can um, go more in depth in all the subjects that are going to be covered uh, in these webinars. We have a, a very tight uh, agenda for 2020 so stay tuned because there will be many other webinars on a number of thematic uh, areas climate smart agricultural uh, agriculture uh, soil restoration water management there will be a number of other thematic areas covered uh, so for today uh, as i was mentioning we will be dealing with um, sustainable food systems and how important it is that these systems are nutrition sensitive and um, so uh, we have today with us two uh, experts that will be covering the thematic area so we have with us um, from the nutrition from the FAO nutrition division uh, Patrizia Fracassi uh, and from Agrinium we have Sylvie Avalon who will also be uh, presenting so we will be starting with um, Patrizia Fracassi I just wanted to invite you all to uh, to as as Fabio was mentioning to um, ask your questions in the Q&A uh, section of, of the platform and um, we will have after the two presentations a moment where we will be able to answer some of the questions we will also be preparing a final document with all the questions and, and the answers that will be made available so now um i also wanted to mention that these webinars are extremely extremely well taken worldwide we are receiving a lot of, of uh, congratulations we are receiving also a lot of requests from many, many partner organizations to have the recordings. And this is really thanks to you, the participants from all, all over the world. So thank you very much. And we will start now with Patricia Fracassi. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm very happy to be part of this webinar. I'm going to talk about food systems for healthy diets and nutrition. Should we care about diet? Six of the top 11 risk factors 
driving the global burden of disease are linked to diet. Unhealthy diets are now responsible for more adult death and disability than tobacco, air pollution, alcohol and unsafe sex. Evidence shows that individuals with underlying diet-related non-communicable diseases have a higher risk of severity of health impact and mortality from infectious diseases. And early reports suggest that this is also true of exposure to COVID-19. It is estimated that over 2 billion people, or 26% of the world population, do not have regular access to safe, sufficient and diverse food. This number includes people with severe food insecurity associated with hunger and those with moderate food insecurity. The poor quality of their diets put these people at greater risk of multiple forms of malnutrition and poor health. Taking a food system approach, we are promoting food security in the broad sense. A food security that ensures sufficient safe and diverse food for all at all times especially for those that are most nutritionally vulnerable, such as children and women. But of course, we want food security, not just for today, but also the future. So we are looking at food systems that enable dietary patterns that promote all dimensions of individual health and well-being have low environmental pressure and impact, are safe, accessible, affordable and equitable, and are culturally acceptable. Let's not forget that eating is also a cultural experience. The latest definition in the state of the food security and nutrition in the world puts emphasis on the range of actors and their interlinked value-adding activities that go from production all the way to consumption and disposal of food products. Food products originate from diverse production systems that are embedded in broader economic societal and natural environments. In this presentation, we will go through the main component of the food systems framework, building on the one agreed by the high level panel of experts on food security and nutrition. First of all, we recognize sustainable healthy diets as a key contributor of nutrition well-being and at the same time a powerful shaper of future food systems. Understanding what people eat is fundamental. First, to identify food groups that are under or overrepresented in local diets. And second, to recognize factors in the food systems that contribute to the current diet imbalances. The food supply chain includes production, storage and distribution, processing and packaging, retail and markets. Decisions made at this stage 
can affect the way food is produced and processed along the supply chain and can also affect the four dimension of sustainability in terms of availability, accessibility, utilization and stability. In the context of COVID-19 pandemic, we see how restrictions in the movement of food and people are impacting the food supply, especially of perishable food. Decisions on what is maintained as essential services will influence the nutrition value of foods and have a significant impact on local diets. When to taking a food systems approach, we do, however, recognize that consumers' demand can also affect supply. The relationship is bidirectional via the food environments, which are the interface between food supply chain and consumers' behavior. The food environment is described according to the following characteristic. The types and diversity of foods available, the affordability of foods, product properties such as quality, appeal, safety and convenience, vendor properties such as the type of outlets, hours of operation, as well as advertising and marketing. New framework also recognize that the individual's engagement with the food environment can vary from person to person, depending on their individual filters, which are economic, cognitive, aspirational, and situational. In the context of COVID-19 pandemic, we see that most innovations are coming from food retailers that had to adjust quickly to the new regulations. We have seen a huge increase in takeaway and delivery services, transforming food to reduce waste, adopting ranges of products to available foods. Consumer behavior reflects all the choices and decisions made by consumers at the household or individual level on what food to acquire, prepare, store, cook and eat. This also includes decisions on the allocations of food within the household, including gender repartition and feeding of children. In the context of COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen a surge in online food orders, but also an increased demand in terms of home cooking. It is still too early to know what the impact on diets will be. Talking about the first example, that looks at value chains that support healthy diets through the three main elements of the food systems. Reorienting agricultural priorities from high volume production to filling nutritional gaps in local diets requires improvement in sustainable and diversified production practices, storage and distribution, processing and pack packaging, retail and markets. Food supply chain can increase the nutritional value of foods by increasing access to micronutrients, improving the properties of food, and destroying foodborne microbes and toxins. Potential actions include biofortification using conventional breeding techniques, food fortification, and processing techniques such as milling, cooling, smoking, and fermentation that help extend the shelf life, 
increasing the bioavailability of nutrients and improving food safety. It is also important to announce exchanges between producers and consumers by shortening supply chains, for example, through improvement of urban-rural linkages and investments in value chain logistics, placing emphasis on foods that contribute to healthy, balanced diet. Consumer behavior is largely shaped by food environments. Fiscal and pricing policies that incentivize foods that contribute to sustainable, healthy diets, coupled with front of package labeling and the regulation of marketing practices, can help to create a favorable food environment. In addition, consumer education can open a pathway towards demand for more sustainable and healthy value chains. Furthermore, increasing knowledge, attitudes and skills for waste reduction can help to minimize the pressure on the environment, especially in urban contexts. During COVID-19, we find that these actions are becoming widely accepted recommendations, especially as perishable foods are being affected by restrictions in the movement of foods and people. Incentives to keep the value chain alive are urgently needed, while on the contrary, generalized food subsidies could be detrimental to the local economy, social inclusion, and the health of the people. Second example, I'm going to talk about school food and nutrition. Taking a food system approach for school food and nutrition implies looking at smallholder friendly school procurement mechanisms that improve diversification and access to fresh foods. Brazil is the most known example where this has been implemented at national scale. Homegrown school feeding programs supported by FAO and World Food Program in several low-income countries are also trying to improve access to fresh foods. But unfortunately, many of these programs are still small scale. Beyond the supply demand, working on school food and nutrition implies creating a favorable food environment by looking at quality standards for school meals while minimizing the sale of unhealthy food products that are rich in fat, sugar, and salt. We also emphasize the importance of education strategies that empower school actors to be the agents of change in their local food systems, as well as responsible consumers that can minimize food waste. In the context of COVID-19 pandemic, we find that the closure of school is jeopardizing the food security of more than 300 million school children that are dependent on school meals. There are examples where civil society organizations have partnered with local catering services to maintain the school meals, but this is not enough. Those we require existing safety net structures to cover for school children. We have seen from the example that the food system is not just the farmers and not just the consumer. The food system is made up of a large range of actors. The 
purpose. Understanding what stands between farmers and consumers is critical. In many low-income countries, the middle is made up of micro, small and medium enterprises, street vendors and many workers in the informal sector. Creating a favorable environment for them is essential to ensure transformative food systems. Importantly, the food systems actors have different expectations in terms of outcomes. High in their agenda are outcomes like productivity, income and jobs. For government, getting tax revenues is also a priority. To add nutrition, gender and climate may seem too much. But we do not have a choice. Many young people get that this is an emergency because our ways of producing, delivering and consuming are in fact jeopardizing their future. Making food systems deliver sustainable healthy diets will require a comprehensive mm -hmm. policy making overview that goes beyond assessing the nutrition situation or the productivity of the supply. This calls for a better understanding of what people eat, what is over or underrepresented in their diets, and how food systems contribute to dietary patterns in terms of challenges and potential solutions. It calls for policy coherence across sectors and balancing potential trade-offs of different decisions to not compromise the health of any individuals, while at the same time tackling different aspects of sustainability in terms of environment, economic, social and cultural dimension. Each step will require the involvement of many large to small scale actors, both public and private. It calls for collaborative efforts when dealing with different priorities, as well as substantial investment in capacity development at all levels. Policy coherence can increase the value added by interlinked actions in food systems but it needs to be backed up by a coherent financial landscape that can leverage from public, private and blended finance. In this slide, I would like to present a number of e-learning modules that have been developed over the past five years and are available in our webpage in this webpage e-learning at fao.org. This includes modules for policy makers, for program planners and implementers, and address the basic concept, nutrition situation analysis, a causal analysis, and also looking at how to improve nutrition through agriculture and food systems. There are also two specific modules, one on uh, sustainable food value chains for nutrition and one on homegrown school feeding that can go into a very large extent of details. Finally, I would like to conclude with a reflection from uh, our work in the nutrition and food system division where we have been looking at the capacity development. These are three key findings from a stock take of resources and consultations with different stakeholders. Number one, we know what to do. Now is the time to address how we are going to deliver to get better results. It is really important to orient capacity development towards implementation and monitoring and evaluation. We need to reach 
out to those that are in the front line. And we can only do that by broadening our partnership and set up a multiplier effect that reaches the community. It is thus important to strengthen partnership to increase the uptake of knowledge and skills, especially among grassroots organizations and small and medium enterprises. We need to translate all this knowledge into different formats and empower people to become the agents of change. Finally, we all agree that capacity development is important. So now we really need to measure how we are succeeding. We need to understand when, where and how we need to improve. It is thus really important to increase learning and accountability on capacity development. Thank you so much, and I look forward to you. Thank you very much. Your views and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Patricia, for, um, for underlining how it is important to have uh, information, um, food systems which are more performant, which are more sustainable, which are more efficient, and which put at the center the nutritional and health status of citizen but also with covid 19 with the, with the pandemic also the importance of shortening the food value chains and uh, trying to promote um, locally uh, produced food so thank you very much um, please have a look at the q a where you have a number of questions from participants and we will be giving you the opportunity to respond uh, during the Q&A session. Um, meanwhile, I would like to uh, give the floor to uh, Sylvie uh, Avalon, who will be continuing to talk to us about uh, uh, food systems, nutrition, and sustainability. Thank you. Thank you very much for having invited me to this very interesting uh, webinar. So here is my presentation. I would like to come back briefly on the data on uh, the different form of malnutrition. We know that we have undernutrition, micronutrient deficiency, and overweight uh, as well. Like uh, 2 billion people are concerned around the world, this means that uh, one in two individuals are concerned, and particularly women and children. They are concerned by uh, wasting, underweight, and uh, children are uh, suffering of stunting with micronutrient deficiencies and also a uh, large uh, part of women are uh, um, touched by uh, anemia. We know that malnutrition contributes to premature death of children and uh, women and it's really uh, urgent to improve the food system to decrease uh, this uh, nutritional disorder. So here is my presentation uh, outline. I will give you uh, directly three uh, type of example of research or tools to improve the food system. And I will begin with uh, some assessment of the consumer behavior and diet in traditional food system. Then uh, we will see how is it possible to improve the fortification strategy by uh, taking into account formulation, packaging, and logistic to better target uh, nutritional outcome. And then we will uh, show briefly how is it possible to uh, improve the food environment by food classification and labeling. So this is my first example. We have done uh, during the last uh, decade diet assessment in traditional food system. And we have targeted children under five and women particularly. We have done this in Africa, in several countries, but also in Cambodia. And we have used 24 hour dietary recall to assess the nutrient and micronutrient intake and the dietary diversity of uh, people living in this traditional food system. We have also described the raw food and the traditional recipe that they are eating. 
uh, we have seen that in our studies, all the people who were living in the traditional food system were mainly family farmers. Uh, they have a diet mainly based on starchy products, but they can have also some micronutrients uh, dense food. For example, sauces based on multi ingredient with uh, leafy vegetable, red palm oil, fruit, uh, fruit nut, for example, but also with mango and small fishes in, for example, Sophistasia. But uh, uh, even if we have some micronutrients dense food, we see that globally these diets are lacking of diversity. They are almost vegan and we have some issue with vitamin A, vitamin B9, B12, iron and zinc. Furthermore, these diets have a great seasonability according to territories and climate. By doing this kind of uh, dietary assessment, we have seen that uh, some uh, food are coming from the uh, activities of a family farming, they are uh, eating their own food, and they can also obtain some food from the environment. So we have highlighted the fact that ecosystem can have a, a feeding function, and in general, people living near forest and lake have the highest uh, diet diversity. It's what we have observed here. You have a picture of a Tonlesap lake in uh, Cambodia. It's a very important uh, lake in the nutritional uh, security in this country. Two million people are relying on it to obtain uh, fish and they, it contributes to their nutrient and micronutrient uh, intake. But since uh, two decades, we see that uh, the biodiversity of fish, but also the quantity of fish are decreasing because of climate change, because of uh, distinct dams that were built on the Mekong River, and also due to the human activities with uh, a residue coming from uh, agriculture activities and also industrial activities. So how is it possible to increase the diet diversity in traditional food system? We still have to strengthen local traditional food system. We have to, to diversify the crops and animals in family farming, and we have to do it uh, during all the year. And we can, to do this, uh, connect farmer to basic post-harvest technology. And we have also to protect fragile ecosystem because some communities are really relying on them. And we see that uh, nutrition is linked to uh, at least three uh, sustainable development goals with climate, life below water, and life on own land. We also see that uh, we have to, tr to valorize traditional recipes because they are based on local food and generate income for farmers. We can integrate them in food composition table, dietary guideline, and nutritional education program. However, we know that healthy diets are not reachable for every people because of their uh, low income. So in case of chronic malnutrition, we can use fortification to prevent deficiency. And in case of food crisis, uh, ready-to-use therapeutic food can cure uh, problems. My second example is on um, um, fortification strategy to address micronutrient deficiencies. This strategy is designed by processor of a supply chain or uh, NGO to target nutritional disorder of uh, consumer and to improve uh, nutritional outcome. However, it's uh, really uh, important that the stakeholder who are doing fortification uh, really take into account the public health issue of a country and the target population they want to, to, to improve uh, nutritional outcome. Uh, each year, FAO, Global Nutrition Report, UNICEF, and uh, uh, World Health Organization are uh, editing some country nutritional profile. And it's really important for the stakeholder to uh, update uh, their uh, knowledge on the nutritional issue in the country targeted. If it is done, fortification is a good way to deliver nutrients to specific population or overall population. If with no need to change dietary pattern or local food system, 
it's easy to set up, quick, and well accepted because it's a, a food-based approach, and it can yield rapid nutritional effect. However, it's uh, required a rather good technicity and coordination of several stakeholders, and sometimes products can be uh, made far from the consumer. This means that they can be shipped uh, on, in a very long supply chain. We know that fortification success depends on the accessibility, affordability, the stability of nutritional profile of the fortified food, but also of the health status of consumer. And it's the reason why we have done several studies on the fortification strategy to assess uh, the, their stability of the, the fortified food within the supply chain. We have uh, assessed the influence of the initial food quality. We have compared distinct types of additives, but also distinct types of packaging. We have also taken into account the logistic condition of the product when where they are shipped during very long uh, distance and marketed and retailed during a long shelf life. We have taken into account the time the exposure to light and sometimes the increase in temperature to mimic the tropical condition. And at least we have also assessed the influence of the culinary practice on the quality of a fortified food. I'm not going to show all the data obtained. We have published paper on this topic. Um, but the lessons learned from the stability studies are uh, summarized here. For example, for the soya oil fortified with three types of vitamin E and D, we have seen that over a period of two months with a PET packaging, we can lose like 40% of the vitamin added in the oil by a reaction, chemical reaction within the oil. The safety and sensorial properties of the product are good, but we can have a decrease in vitamin E and vitamin D and even in uh, some polyunsaturated fat. So uh, we should recommend that the fortified oil um, to be really protected from light and from temperature uh, increase. And fortified oil should not be used for frying, but more for seasoning. A second study was done on wheat flour fortified with minerals uh, over a period of six months and at two temperatures to mimic the tropical condition. And we have compared uh, packaging in uh, paper bags or PET aluminum bag. Our main conclusion were that the best packaging was uh, PET aluminum bags. Uh, most of the nutritional profile was stable with protein, minerals, vitamins, B9 or B12 within the floor, but vitamin A was uh, lost uh, with around 40% in three months. So we have to take care with long uh, shelf life. The last study we have done uh, was uh, done in the real world. We have sampled 1945 uh, infant formula from Ethiopia, Cambodia, Madagascar, Vietnam, Burkina Faso, and Ivory Coast. We have uh, sampled real product in uh, the supermarket. Uh, these products uh, have uh, one month or up to 19 months of uh, storage within the supply chain, and we have assessed the nutritional profile and packaging uh, of these uh, products. We have seen that uh, within the, during the shelf life, the safety and sensory property were very good, but uh, a part of the nutritional profile was degraded by peroxidation of lipid, and vitamin E and D were concerned, but it was not the case for minerals and protein. So we should recommend to decrease the shelf life of fortified product um, to guarantee the nutritional claim to less than one year. Unit dose of this product were very efficient to protect the nutritional profile of, uh, the pro of uh, fortified food, but we know that this type of packaging would generate environmental issue. Now I will present the third example with the labeling and the improvement of the food environment. 
we know that food uh, processing is done with distinct type of stakeholders, with small, medium or large uh, enterprise. We produce uh, different uh, type of uh, uh, products with uh, minimally processed one, very close to the nature. And we can have a highly processed uh, product with very long list of ingredients, additive and sometimes complex uh, processing. It's the reason why a new classification, the NOVA classification, was built by uh, several uh, authors to uh, try to, uh, to describe the, as much as possible the level of processing and formulation of uh, processed food. It's interesting because uh, worldwide we know that the current trends indicate that uh, processed food are uh, becoming uh, very important in the diet of consumer. And we know that in some countries, ultra processed food are becoming predominant. The characteristic of these uh, products are that they are high, uh, they have a high content in energy, fat, sugar, and salt, with no matrix effect. This means that their uh, content is highly bioavailable in the human gut when uh, the product is consumed. They are also poor source of protein, fiber, and micronutrients, and they can have some time, long shelf life, and very big portion. Several epidemiological studies were uh, done to uh, assess the effect of the consumption of ultra-processed food, and uh, recently it was demonstrated that it was linked to weight gain, obesity, non-communicable disease in several countries, and it was also linked to the cancer risk in Nutrinet cohort. The problem with a non-communicable disease is that they contribute to an increasing number of deaths and an increasing number of public uh, health costs. It's the reason why new tools were developed recently to help consumers in making healthier food choice. In general, this approach are uh, based on nutrient profiling and food labeling. I'm showing here the example of my country, the French uh, Nutri-Score. Uh, it's uh, calculated uh, based, based on uh, negative uh, nutrients such as salt, sugar, and fat. It, it integrates uh, as positive component the fibers content and the fruit and vegetable uh, present in the, as a percentage of a recipe. We have seen like uh, 200 companies have uh, integrated the Nutri-Score now. Uh, some of them have uh, done a reformulation step by step. This means that they have uh, begun to decrease the content in salt, sugar, and fat, or increasing the level of fiber or vegetable, if possible, in the recipe. And we see that they are trying to come more in the middle of a classification uh, Nutri-Score. Uh, this uh, French Nutri-Score is now adopted by several European, European countries. But uh, unfortunately, it is not mandatory. So we will see in the future if uh, it will change. And uh, we think that maybe it could have a risk on focusing only on the quality of a single food by just looking the Nutri-Score, while we know that uh, the really important thing is to have a healthy diet as a whole uh, on a daily basis and not just uh, eat some uh, Put with a good labeling uh, sometime. Uh, again, there is another comment, labeling should not be used only to communicate. Uh, we hope that company will really integrate nutrition issue in their strategy and not just try to improve the labeling uh, on, on the formulation. As we have seen, uh, nutrition uh, and health are a very uh, complex uh, issue. They are multifactorial. We can say that they are linked to uh, eight sustainable uh, DGs, uh, and I have uh, spoken of three of them uh, just uh, uh, in the previous uh, slide. As uh, the topics are very complex, we really need to educate the overall society in order to build competency of the stakeholder, 
in the university by creating, for example, new teaching units in the academic. Uh, but it's also uh, necessary to build competency within the private sector, within the public policy maker and the consumer themselves. And we have to motivate them to maximize nutrition uh, outcome. For example, we are currently involved in an Erasmus capacity building project with the Institute of Technology of Cambodia to uh, train a new generation of entrepreneurs in sustainable agriculture and food engineering. And we are going to build new teaching units for several uh, partners uh, with uh, also European and other university in Cambodia. And we are very happy to participate to the massive open online course under preparation by FAO and uh, their partners. So as a conclusion, I will say that uh, no single food or no strategy will improve nutrition in the next decade. I think that we have to combine complementary approaches because they have efficiency on a different time scale and we have to make the difference between emergency and development. But in my opinion, strengthening the traditional uh, food system should be prioritized because it has the advantage to stimulate local economy with jobs, income creation, and it valorizes food identity and culture with less negative externalities such as food miles or packaging issue. So we can say that food system should be a part of a solution of a global issue, and we have to seek win-win situation between nutrition, health, poverty, and environment. So it's my last uh, slide. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvie, uh, for, for this excellent presentation on the importance of, uh, of uh, diversification of food for, for healthy and balanced uh, uh, diets and for nutritional status, but also fortification. And uh, actually, I found the nutrition, the, the nutrition score very interesting because um, uh, I know that in Chile, they have done a, a similar score using the traffic light to indicate uh, amounts of uh, salt, fat and sugar in the different products. And they are working also a lot on the labeling, which is extremely important uh, because consumers need to be aware of, of what they are consuming and everything has to be done in a transparent manner. And uh, regarding labeling, FAO has, uh, has a number of guidelines for private sector uh, in order to ensure uh, transparent and, and um, la labeling. Um, in addition, I wanted to mention that um, several of the thematic areas that have been covered in both presentations are available in a number of FAO e-learning courses on the FAO e-learning academy. We also have a course on uh, home-based um, home school feeding uh, programs and also on food composition and also on uh, um, the linkages between uh, agriculture, uh, food value chains and nutritional state, nutritional and health status of the population. I know that in one of the questions um, somebody was raising the importance of gender and um, uh, in the food system and in nutrition. And I wanted to mention that from the FAO side, in all our courses, gender is a cross-cutting thematic area that is always being considered. Uh, so this is, has always been taken into consideration. In addition, I wanted to mention that uh, for many of the sustainable development goals, we also have courses for the countries on how to uh, collect, measure, analyze the SDGs. So have a look on the Academy. And uh, last important point that was mentioned by Sylvie is that we are also developing together with Agrinium, with the UNICEF, with the World Bank, uh, a very, very um, comprehensive uh, MOOC on uh, nutrition and food systems. And we will uh, make sure that you are all informed of when the, the MOOC uh, is going to be available. Of course, it will be open and it will be free uh, and offered as a global public good. So uh, thanks to both speakers. I would like to give the floor now to Patricia, 
Uh, I hope you have had the time to have a look at the questions to provide some of the answers. Patricia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And uh, it was really, really a very rich uh, conversation uh, from the question and answer. So I'm, I've signed some of the, of the question. Um, so there were many questions related with the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, I want to say that uh, uh, in FAO, there is a web page that contains all the policy brief and uh, perhaps Christina, we can provide the, the link uh, because a number of policy brief has been developed to address uh, specific issues that are coming out uh, uh, in taking a food systems uh, approach. So it's, it's good to have it as a reference. But um, if, um, I mean, one of the questions was really straight, what do you think are the most most urgent uh, uh, policy recommendations. And, uh, and one that is really urgent is that uh, governments really ensure that uh, food and agricultural services are kept alive, they are maintained open, so within the safe condition, but that's really important because uh, uh, if there is uh, restrictions on movement of uh, foods and people, this will really affect the supply chain uh, terribly. Um, in fact, our chief economist, uh, Maximo Torero, has already mentioned in several uh, interviews that there is no need for a food crisis because there is enough uh, food supply, but the food crisis could come from uh, restrictions uh, in trade and the restriction in labor. So it's, it's really important that this kind of uh, uh, policy is, 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 is maintained. Then another uh, um, aspect that I mentioned is that the, the, the risk for the most vulnerable uh, population and uh, policy measures that are put in place is to expand uh, the social protection, the safety net. And uh, again, I mean, with the school being closed, uh, and the issue of the access to school meals, it becomes really important to consider school children also as one of the vulnerable uh, category that needs to be considered when you are talking about expanding social protection. And then the third is really uh, to give the space uh, for innovation uh, to the civil society and recognizing also the role of the private sector in, uh, in adapting and ensuring that um, the, food, uh, the food value chain are kept alive. So this is something that I wanted to mention in the response to many of the, of the questions around uh, COVID. So more specific policy brief are available in FAO and there is even one that is specific on the COVID-19 pandemic impact on fishery the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic impact on informal workers because they are also recognized as very vulnerable and the impact on uh, um, migrants um, as again a very vulnerable uh, group. Um, there was uh, one question around uh, monitoring and evaluating um, nutrition sensitive uh, uh, approaches. And uh, one thing that we really uh, are emphasizing um, um, within uh, our division or, that is on nutrition and food systems is to really make very clear what is the impact pathway. And uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, the impact on, uh, on the diversity of diet is an important uh, measurement uh, on the contribution of the project towards nutrition, because we do recognize the importance of diet as a contributor to, to nutrition. So in terms of uh, monitoring and evaluation, I really want to emphasize the importance of developing, of having very clear what is the impact pathway from production storage, distribution, access, and eventually uh, use of uh, foods that contribute to a balanced diet. Uh, there were questions on the trade-offs 
uh, which is something that is uh, inevitable because we are dealing with uh, multiple stakeholders. We, we are dealing with the civil society, with the private sector, with government policies, and we are dealing, as I mentioned, with different types of outcomes. So the only way to, to deal with the trade-off is to make them explicit and recognizable and as part of the policy dialogue. So that's, that's one way of, uh, of dealing with, uh, with the trade-offs. Um, I'm just looking at uh, some other questions. There was one question on, uh, on how to ensure that uh, schools are not becoming a venue for uh, the private sector to, to sell uh, unhealthy snacks. And, and that's why we are talking about um, uh, school food and nutrition framework. Uh, where we are not only looking at the homegrown school feeding programs as a way to shorten um, the food value chain between the school and the local community and also access um, fresh product, but also the school as an agent of change. So a school that where there is an environment that doesn't allow the sale of um, uh, food that are high in salt, uh, sugar, and, uh, and fat. So there are great examples from uh, Latin America, and uh, I will be able to respond more in detail to, to this question. Thank you. These were just some of the questions that I could get from the very long list. Excellent. Thank you very much. So I would like to also respond to some of the questions. The, the, the first thing is uh, uh, I wanted to mention that as uh, Patricia was, um, was describing, uh, the main source of information regarding COVID that we use is the FAO uh, policy briefs. But I wanted to underline that these policy briefs are not only FAO. It is the result of an interaction with all the governments of the member countries and the national representations, uh, FAO representations are also contributing to these policy briefs that really reflect the situation in the various countries. Uh, the, other, um, the other issue I wanted to mention is that uh, some of you are interested in the milk that we are developing. Uh, we are still developing it, so it is not uh, ready yet, but towards the end of the year, probably uh, we will start and you will be notified all those who participate to the uh, to these webinars will receive um, will receive an announcement uh, of the MOOC when we are ready. Uh, and then um, the third um, issue that I wanted to mention is uh, the fact that uh, uh, some of you were mentioning if you can get a certificate of uh, attendance. So I wanted to mention that for this webinar, if you also uh, follow the course uh, on um, which is called improving nutrition through um, through agriculture and food systems. If you follow that course on the FAO eLearning Academy, you can get um, a, a digital badge certificate, and this is a certification of the acquisition of. So it has uh, it is recognized internationally as as a certificate of competences. So if in addition to the webinar, you also uh, go through the course and pass the, the, the test, you will get a, a digital badge um, on a, a digital badge that certifies the acquisition of competences. So these are the three uh, items I wanted to mention. And now I would like to give the floor to uh, Sylvie, who will be answering to some of your questions. Sylvie? Yes. So sorry, I was uh, reading all the, the topic. It's very, very rich and interesting. Uh, so briefly, um, yes, somebody was asking me why I did not uh, speak much more about uh, post-harvest technology. But indeed, indeed uh, it's right. We have to increase the basic post-harvest technologies in ter territory. Uh, to decrease the food losses, and this will uh, definitely contribute to a, a bet, a best uh, food security. But I'm not a specialist on this uh, issue. It's the reason why I did not develop it, but it's really uh, important too. Uh, somebody asked me um, in the, why in the traditional food system I was saying that, that they were almost uh, eating uh, vegan. 
uh, in fact, is, um, I was uh, speaking about the survey we have uh, done, uh, for example, in Burkina Faso, uh, uh, in Benin uh, or Madagascar, we have observed, for example, for children, uh, that um, like um, 95 or 96 uh, percentage of children are not um, eating uh, meat, fish, milk, egg per day when we are making a food assessment. So it's the reason why I was saying that they, they have a, a very uh, plant-based uh, diet and uh, this type of diet are very... Uh, uh, are not efficient to deliver the micronutrient available uh, uh, and it's the reason why the children have a lot of uh, micronutrient deficiencies. But indeed in Cambodia, I show it, uh, there, there is a particularity uh, of having a very big uh, lake within the country and a lot of poor communities are uh, relying on this lake to obtain during some period fish and these fish contribute to their uh, nutritional requirement but uh, we know that uh, to protect the fish resource and to allow the breeding it's not possible to to catch and to fish during all the years so this means that at some period uh, it's uh, it's illegal to fish and uh, if we we are using too much this resource uh, we know that we will increase uh, the, the loss uh, in biodiversity is the reason why I was saying that uh, even in this country it was possible to observe very plant-based uh, uh, diet. Um, when I was speaking about uh, the fact that it uh, would be necessary to shorten the shelf life of fortified food, uh, I was saying it to uh, be sure that the nutritional claim are still uh, efficient, still uh, true and transparent. Well, we know that in tropical countries, the temperature uh, is uh, sometimes very high, and this temperature increases the degradation within the product, so the vitamin can be uh, degraded uh, in, uh, for example, one year in some products. But it, I was not saying that it was necessary to decrease the shelf life for safety issue. It was not for safety issue or for sensory uh, Problem. It was uh, only for uh, uh, lipophilic compound uh, uh, profile. Um, it's true, uh, I have forgotten to integrate in the sustainable uh, development goals link uh, to uh, nutrition. The SDG 12 uh, could be also linked uh, to the nutritional issue. It's true, we can, uh, somebody has noticed it and uh, uh, they're right. Um, one last question I, I had the time to read. Uh, is it possible to obtain an equilibrated uh, diet uh, all around the world? Yes, it's, it's feasible, uh, taking uh, into account the biodiversity uh, in each country and uh, several uh, teams have worked on this to uh, see how is it possible to formulate uh, an equilibrated and uh, healthy diet according to the local resources. It's feasible, but the problem is that uh, as we have a, a great poverty gap, some people don't have, uh, doesn't have uh, the income uh, to allow them to buy the healthy diet. It's the reason why it's difficult for them to fulfill all uh, their uh, nutri uh, nutrient uh, requirements. I'm sorry, I didn't have time to, to read more questions. <laughs> we don't hear you, Christina. <laughs> okay, thank you very much to both uh, Patricia and Sylvie, but special thanks to all the participants. We, I am really amazed about the number of, of questions, interesting questions and uh, and some of them show us that you were extremely careful during the presentation. So we are really pleased about this result. We um, be sure that we, we are working behind the scenes to create a, a document on the questions and answers. We cannot make them, we cannot cover all the questions because we've really received many, but we will make sure to, to, to compile some of the questions and to uh, to share with you the, the recording and also the, the presentations and the Q&A session 
so that you uh, so th so that uh, everything is available to uh, everyone any anywhere and anytime in the anytime. So uh, thank you very much to uh, the presenters, but to the participants all over the world, and also behind the scenes, special thanks to uh, to Sara Ferrante, Fabio Picinic, and Aristide. Uh, Bulcare for, for their support and for the logistics uh, on, on the platform and the organization of the materials uh, around the, these webinars. So thank you all very much. And we really hope to see you at the next one. You will receive thank an you. announcement. <laughs> and, uh, Fabio, the next one will be on? It will be on the topic of climate change. Exactly. So the next one we will be on the topic of climate change and we really look forward to having you all participate. Remember that if you wish to have the, the certification, uh, you just have to also uh, have a look at the existing course on the FAO eLearning Academy and you will be receiving uh, the, the digital badge that certifies your competences in, uh, in nutrition and food systems. Thank you all very much for your for your participation and really look forward to seeing you next time. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to everyone and of course to the speakers and the moderator. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>